Thank you for coming, first of all, and uh, for the presentation, Pierre, organization of, the, of this um, conference that we can meet again here. Uh, okay, I, th this is a simple hangout. I, I didn't, uh, unfortunately, present, uh, uh, make a presentation. It's like just some quotes because I will be working on this uh, chapter 25 of Tao Te Ching. Uh, and thank you again for the, uh, in fact, for the flexibility because I'll be uh, talking more about um, Greek and Chinese philosophy. So not to, uh, not about the Japanese philosophy, but as we know, uh, Japanese philosophy without Chinese philosophy, it would be difficult to um, to imagine. Uh, so we had a. Uh, we were talking about this metaphysical approach to the cosmos, universe, and, and nature, and I would like to uh, now to try to to uh, have a different approach to that, which I would call like a non-metaphysical. Um, so, in the last, in the paper presented last year, I distinguished three notions of nature, of natural world, on the basis of my reading of uh, Heidegger and Watsuji. Firstly, is the nature opposed to culture, uh, being the object and domain of application of the positive sciences, especially of the modern physics, which tends to give the measure of, of adequa adequacy for other sciences. This notion is mostly criticized by philosophers for trying to reduce human beings to a bunch of elementary uh, particles and misconceiving the human life world uh, from which those sciences arose. Secondly, the nature is understood as a I quote Watsuji as the structural moment of human existence. So the environment that, uh, which encircles first and foremost human being in his everyday dealings, concerned and caring with its needs and aims. The, this notion exposes some aspects of Watsuji's fudo and the meaning of the natural world also for Heidegger, so the Umwelt. Uh, this understanding of nature is sometimes criticized by ecologically oriented thinkers as being too anthropo anthropocentric. And the third, no, uh, third notion of nature uh, that I did not expose sufficiently last year in some way escapes this critique since it is large, largely nature oriented and also ele elementary or elemental, let's say, yet in a meaning far from the first sense. It is men mentioned at the very beginning of the book of Watsuji when he states that the ancient term of Fudo was in fact su Suido, and it's a short quote from Watsuji. Behind this notion, so suido, uh, behind this notion lies the ancient uh, view of nature, shizen, uh, and man's environment, kankyo, compounded of earth, water, fire, and wind. End of quotation. In what follows, I would like to take a closer look on this ancient view of uh, nature in two cultures and distinct philosophical traditions, so Greek and Chinese, that originated around the same time, like 6th uh, century BC. I will be speaking, therefore, of the archaic notion of physis in Greece, which was the main theme of consideration of so-called pre-Socratics, and of the concept of tsiran in ancient Taoism. Both readings will be supported by subsequent traditions that emerge from, the, from those initial philosophies. On the one hand, we have Aristotle, uh, whose reading of physis was both, I quote Heidegger, the last uh, echo of the original and thus supreme thoughtful pro uh, projection of the essence of physis, end of the quotation, and decisive uh, for the course of entire Western metaphysics. On the other hand, we have Taoism, uh, uh, Neo-Taoism, with Wang Bi and Guo Xiang, which reading, uh, whose readings of the classics were essential for Taoist uh, philosophical tradition. So, talking of nature in its elemental dimension, nature compiled of earth, fire, air, water, wind, and so on, in a philosophically interesting way that is far from reducing into some pre-scientific discourse of the first philosophers, it's of growing interest nowadays for the phenology trying to examine the sense of the natural world. There is an ongoing trend to see in the natural world a kind of universalistic background of life world. Those analyses have for prerequisite the undeniable fact of our corporeal uh, existence in the world, which seems to have two axes of presence. One is the like this, spatial, one is the earth in its uh, weightfulness, weightfulness, a solid support and, I quote Patochka, prototype for 
all what is massive, corporeal and material, which is a kind of phenomenological, phenomenological universal body, the donator of the wear and measure of proximity. The second, I, I call it acts of presence, is the temporal one, the sky, the, the donator of the when, whose essence is defined by the remoteness and which comprises, on the contrary, all what is intangible. I quote, again, Matoshka, heavens, the light and the darkness, the stars and the celestial bodies, all that closes our horizon without end, which forms the outside and the inside, encompassing us continuously. End of the quotation. This phenomenology of nature tries to highlight the, wor the world in the strict sense of the term, le monde au sens fort du terme. That is, the, wor the world that is autonomous from us and has to restore the ancient physis as the space-time, that is, I quote again Patochka, the, pre is, the ancient, try to restore the ancient physics as the space-time, that is the preliminary, total, and non-individuated uh, non framework of all individuation. End of the quotation. It is the world of uh, becoming in which human existence is one of the move movements. Whether this general framework of the space-time is universal across the cultures in its minimal formulation as the undifferen undi undifferentiated hula of all becoming. It's not the question of this presentation. I would like to introduce another act of presence. It is not the question uh, presence to the two aforementioned. In my opinion, even a more basic one, having this privilege that it tends to escape the structure of Western metaphysics and therefore may be achieving some kind of universality in its singularity. Because in its formal articulation, it cannot be but the singularity. Um, it is fact facticity apprehended as the movement in its ontological and me-ontological dimension. Before I start an exposition of the Heideggerian reading of the Greek physis and, the, and then turn to the Taoist da concepts of theorem, I have to make a few pre pre preliminary clarifications. First, the facticity a technical term within early Heideggerian philosophy, which I, which I understand in a broader sense, is a name for a non-metaphysically understood presence, as present, uh, present, Anwesenheit in the German, as presenting in a verbal uh, way, so as Anwesen, which essentially comprises the moment of, also the moment of absence, Abwesen. So it is like basically Anwesen from Abse, Abwesen, presenting of the absence. Secondly on, this level, uh, secondly, on this level by ontology, I mean less the question concerning the being or the nothing, whose discourse is necessarily linked to the Western metaphysics, also in its meontological dimension, but the question pertaining to the meaning of the presence. Ontology is a science whose possibility is to be explained. Being does not elucidate, it is to be clarified. Uh, thirdly, by the structure of metaphysics, I mean its ontological constitution, like ac according to Heidegger. It's a thesis put forward by Heidegger and its history of being, which accuracy is problematic from the historical point of view, but her heuristically, it offers the broadest definition of it, and in consequence, makes a potential escape from this framework more difficult. Uh, so, like, briefly, this ontotology means every discourse uh, that explicitly investigates or implicitly presupposes in one form or another being or God through logic, that is, through the very discourse about them. And it's also committed to the basic operation of grounding, so giving and searching for a reason. So let us try maybe this not uh, metaphysical approach to the meaning of physics and Tziran. This kind of approach is what exactly Heidegger strives uh, for in his reading of Aristotle, even though he claims that, I quote Heidegger, uh, metaphysics is just as much physics as physics is metaphysics, end of the quotations, uh, pointing therefore to the fundamental character of the science sought after by Aristotle. Uh, and it's embeddedness of metaphysics in the uh, realm of the sublunary world. Since, I quote again, Aristotle's physics is the hidden and therefore never adequately studied foundational book of Western philosophy. End of the quotation. So the guiding principle for Aristotle, Aristotle's interpretation uh, is that physis is usia. So the physis is kind of beingness, Zionheit. 
This is the Heideggerian translation of, of the term, which normally is rendered as substance, to put an emphasis on its original meaning in ancient Greek uh, of the verb to be in gerund feminine uh, singular. It is said to be a turning point of Western metaphysics, or maybe its initial point, since thereafter physics is understood as a kind of being. However, Aristotle claims so. Uh, however, Aristotle claims so in many fragments. He also states in the book Gamma of Metaphysics uh, that I quote Aristotle: "Since we are seeking the first principles and the highest causes, clearly there must be some physis, physistis, to which." These belong as themselves. Uh, this claim that the first principles uh, are high and the highest causes are physicists, so a kind of physics, is the reversal of the metaphysical statement, and it is, I quote Heidegger, an echo of the great beginning of Greek philosophy, an echo of the original physics that was projected as the being of beings. Zion is Zion. This can be heard still in the double characterization of nature in the Greek philosophy when we speak, for example, about the nature of things, the nature of human being, uh, and so on. We mean, by, we mean by that the essence of a thing which out of, the metaphysical, uh, which out of the metaphysical and scientific framework does not pertain to the material foundation of a thing. This being that is physics, in contrast to the beingness of things, is rather nothing, since, since it is nothing of beings. It is no thing, and only in the precise sense it can be called a nothing or no nothingness. For this reason, the original or archaic physis is not beingness, so Zion had or Usia, but it is being in the sense of the more like paru, paru, parousia, so presence, understood in a gerundive meaning, again, so like a verbal. Um, we try, I quote Heidegger, we try to bring out in our world what is most proper in it by saying that it is not a beingness but presencing instead of presentness. So, anwesen and not anwesenheit. Uh, we mean, what we mean here is not mere presence for Handenheit and certainly not something that is exhausted merely in stability. Rather, presencing is in, in the sense of coming forth into the unhidden placing itself into the open. One does not get at the meaning of presencing by referring to the mere duration, uh, end of the quotation, nor one can get the meaning of presencing by referring exclusively to spatial terms. Um, so, it is through the movement that the meaning of physics as presencing can be grasped, and, and it is thanks to Aristotle that the necessary relation between physics and movement was stated for the first time in the Western in the Western philosophical terms. He was also the one who tried to retrieve the being of the movement in the strict sense against Eleatics and Plato. According to him, the movement is, I quote, difficult to see but it accepts being. End of the quotation. We see here the accession of a full ontological sta status of movement, and for this reason we will, we will be talking of mobility or mo motion rather than of movement. Mobility, the vague height, is a term that could serve as a guiding concept throughout the philosophy of, uh, of Heidegger. So his, what thought, uh, his way of thought starts with the statement of the great fact of life. I quote here a scholar, Alexander Kisha. Um, so a pre-phenomenological ur etwas goes through the existential analysis of factis, factitial mobi mobility of life. It's factitially labels the vector in its basic inten intentional structure to the th thought of Ereignis, which is nothing else than the abyssal facticity of being or life. And all this way he was accompanied by Aristotle, who is the first to draw the attention to ontological characterization of the movement. So mobility is not a spe special and temporal characterization of some <laughs> substance or a thing. It is mode of being of something that can be moved that is preliminary determined by the movedness or mobility. For Aristotle, it is only one region of being, but for Heidegger, following the reversal sketched above, it is the original sense of physics, before it was grasped as being in its beingness, and starting the metaphysical tradition. The famous definition of physics provided by Aristotle is that physics, I quote, is a principle of motion and change, archae kinesios kai metabolesis. 
Uh, more specifically, and in the Heideggerian translation of the ontological term, physics is presented as follows in the second book of Metaphysics. You have this quote uh, on the paper, on the hand, I know. In German, <laughs> uh, in German, I read in English, accordingly, physics is something like origin and ordering, and therefore originary source, or the self-moving and resting, of something in which it is antecedently, hypo, exercises originating and ordering power, uh, pr primarily in itself and from itself and toward itself and thus never in such a way that the Arche would appear in the being only incidentally. From the outset, we see that the physis is defined as Arche, which traditionally means principle, but origi originally as coming, com coming from the verb Arche, meaning the beginning to, uh, to, to begin, to rule, to govern. Therefore, Arche is indeed rather origin and ordering, as uh, Heidegger translated it. Um, accordingly, physis is something first, Arche, to begin, proton, that makes possible the moving and resting of this in which it is always already, Hiparche, and, it's, and, it, and itself, so katauto. Physics is always in things, hypokaimena, since there is no movement without a material substratum. But physics is not the first matter, protehila, absolutely indeterminate like arithmiston proton of antiphon, a peron of anaximander, or maybe also like hora of Plato. It is not a dynamic back background for all indi individuation or a space-time uh, of all becoming mentioned before. Certainly becoming is the most proper motion or, or change characterizing physics, but, it's first, but it is first and foremost, and it is here the most decisive point of my presentation, a form. Physics is a form. Morphe is a, uh, in a sense of, uh, like physics is morphe in a sense of eidos, eidos or appearance. Uh, Aristotle states that heara morphe physics, so physics is Morphe. Therefore, physics is the mobility as appearance. This is con consistent with the Aristotelian definition of the motion, which is, I quote Aristotle, fulfillment of what is potential as potential. So, physics is appearance and thus energia or entelecheia, both of them already signifying possibility in its highest point. A mobility, sorry. All, both of them, energia and entelecheia, signifying the mobility in its highest uh, point. So, uh, I quote Heidegger to this passage, the commentary, the purest manifestation of the essence of movedness that we are looking for is to be found where rest does not mean the breaking off and cessation of a movement, but rather where movedness is gathered up into, the, into standing still, and where this ingathering, far from excluding movedness, includes and for the, t for the first time discloses it. So this uh, standing still, the rest, Ruhe, as having itself in its end, so that's the translation of uh, Entelecheia, or standing at work, translation of Energia. So this rest as having itself in its end, or standing in the work, in the, uh, in the appearance, does not mean conclusion, truth. Paradoxically, paradoxi paradoxically, the movedness as entelecheia is ateles. It is defined by Aristotle as energeia ateles, an incomplete, ateles, incomplete, actuality, which sounds like an oxymoron. How should we understand that? Uh, according to me, he gives examples for this incomplete actuality that is neither action, practice, nor actualization, uh, he gives these uh, examples of this actuality in special acts that at the first sight have nothing to do with the mobility of physics or the physical realm. It is, he gives examples of this uh, incomplete actuality in seeing, horam, understanding, pronoun, thinking, noain, living, zen, and being happy. Those, are, those acts are in fullest sense energia, yet they are not movements since they do not have an end. Uh, movements, are movements are incomplete in a sense that they are, uh, by definition, not in the end, uh, which uh, they are striving. 
um, I quote uh, Aristotle, for it is not true that at the same time we are walking and have walked, are building and have built, or are becoming to be and have come to be. So the examples of movements, and now according to me, examples of the energy, so the incomplete actuality that is mo uh, mobility, in fact. So, but it is, I quote him, Aristotle, but it is the same thing that at the same time has seen and is seen, or is thinking and has thought. End of the quotation. This energia is a, in fact, perfect actuality in its grammatical sense of perfectum. So, that is, of bearing in itself the past movement on which it, on which it is an accomplishment. And yet the same perfect actuality is essentially without end, without limits. I quote again Aristotle, if not, uh, if it had limits, yeah. if not, the process would have had some time to cease, and the process of making things ceases, so movement, the pr process of making things ceases. But as it is, it does not cease. We are living and have lived. So this kind of actuality is ateles, but in other sense, that of, the, uh, of movement that is not yet in the end. It is always already perfectum, uh, in, uh, in the end, but without the horizon of the end, our istom. Only in this sense it is infinite, not as an actual or potential infinite, but, I quote Wittgenstein now, uh, it is unlimited, uh, it is un unlimited does not mean that it goes on without ever stopping, that it increasingly, uh, that it increases immeasurably, but that it lacks the institution of the end, that is not finished off. As one can say of a sentence, that it is not finished off uh, if it has no period. That is the definition of infinite, the sentence that has no period. A non-metaphysical notion of physics has a, for a model this kind of coming into uh, appearance as a perfect and indefinite actuality. Living is at the same time already has lived and never ceased to live. But since this is not a divine actuality, it is at the same time radi radically finite. This is exactly what I call in fact, uh, facticity uh, in its larger sense. So, sorry for being too... too, too uh, how, how much time? Uh, now, Tsiran. <laughs> okay, how should this consideration help us with the understanding of the ancient Chinese Tsiran? The biggest advantage of the Heidegger reading of original physics is that it tries to break through the Western metaphysical framework and reach the minimal phenomenological understanding of nature as presencing of the absencing, coming forth into appearing and by the very fact of this manifestation staying hidden. This mobility and circulation is not a physical movement of coming from one state to another and then going back to the first state. This all-encompassing nature, ever-changing and eternally becoming, a dynamic space-time, a non-individuated matter, or a space like also nothingness underlying everything is a highly metaphysical concept that could be accepted in a way by some presocratics, some German idealists, also some Deleuze, for example, and new, um, uh, yeah, or some modern science also. This is not, to my mind, what the concept of Tsiran and, and Dao want to say, and the above presented retrograde reading of physics could help us to understand. Uh, so, from the first uh, from the five chapters of Dao, the Jing, 1723, uh, from, the, from the five chapters of Dao, the Jing, where the concept of Tsiran occurs, the most important is, in the context of this presentation, is the chapter 25, you have it, since it is the most ambiguous. The famous ending fragment is rendered as follows by Chan Wing Tsi. Man, mo uh, man models himself after earth, earth, earth models itself after heaven, heaven models itself after Tao, and Tao models itself after nature. End of the quotation. We know that the ancient Chinese term for the universe, world, or what we call the nature in the contemporary Western sense is, mo is not, not at all Tiran, but uh, Tiendi, or the Tenshi. Um, uh, translated Tiran as nature in the Ascent of principles, like at the end of this fragment, 
runs the risk of hypostizing it into some metaphysical instance, like a metaphysical substratum. It is the same risk that runs the concept of Tao in the same, uh, the same chapter, which is, I quote, something undifferentiated and yet complete, which existed before heaven and earth, soundless and formless. It depends on nothing and does not change. Uh, end of the quotation. The sign uh, Huen uh, could be easily read as kind of chaos, or again, to, to take an example of the Greek philosophy, is arithmiston proton, so not rhythm, uh, the first that it, it has no rhythm, uh, which needs some rhythmos, formation in the genesis of 10,000 10, things, one mood, so everything. Tao, in this sense, is indeed, would be indeed understood as a, some kind of mother of all that is under heaven, as an indet, indeter, indeterminate horror of Plato, for example, mother and nurse that accepts ideas and engenders sensual world. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm yeah. We could easily bypass this uh, substantive hiletic or spatial reading by drawing our attention to the particularity of Chinese language. Most of Chinese characters do not have specific, uh, specific grammatical function and can have different meanings according to the position of the sentence. Accordingly, Dao uh, means as a noun, way, method, and as a verb to say, to talk, to think. In a way, it could be translated also as weighing, or in German as wegen, or the sich bewegen, which means moving or even uh, could be also trans translating, and that's the translation of uh, Rolf Elbefeld, Bewegtheit, so the word that was used, uh, used by Heidegger, uh, movedness. This translation could hi highlight a possible si similarity between the concept of Tao and physics. Rolf Elberfeld claims as follows. Uh, okay, I have it in German. So, Bewegtheit scheint mir die Qualität dessen zu sein, was vor allem in alten China mit dem Zeichen Dao zur Sprache gebracht werden, worden ist. In der alten chinesischen Philosophie ging es vor allem darum, aufmerksam zu werden auf Bewegtheit und Vollzug. End of the quotation. But I would rather try to show in the following that movedness should not be understood as a quality of Tao, but rather as the very movedness itself that I analyzed above. In this reading will, uh, in this reading will help us the consideration of the formal operator of Tziran, as I called it. We should not understand Tziran as a nature in nominal sense, even though it is possible in modern Chinese, as also in, in Japanese, uh, since it was not in classical language, classical Chinese. It was primarily used as an adjective, an adverb, or verb. The two, the two characters of the Tziran, so or Shizen, mean self, oneself, one's own, and so, for Tzu, and uh, Ran uh, is li like that as such. Thus, it means rather spontaneous or natural, but we, would, should, we should follow a, a more literal translation of itself sowing. Furthermore, the, more, uh, the word Siren, according to neo uh, neo one b is a term without characterization, but rather a word in an extremely radical sense. It means it is neither a name or designation, but the formal marker of becoming self, excuse me, of uh, appro appropriation. This understanding is far more accurate, according to me, and it clues from the outset the hiletic reading, the possible hiletic reading. However, it is still possible of doing another metaphysical interpretation of Tao and Siran in a way that highlights the becoming of the universe, the ever-changing nature and Tao as an immanent and creative principle. Uh, like, for example, uh, uh, in Lao Tzu we have chapter 42, Tao produ produced the one, the one produced the two, the two produced the three, and the three produced the 10,000 things, so the, all, all what is in the universe. The name for Tao is great, it does not change. However, in the chapter we have, now being great means functioning everywhere, functioning everywhere means far-reaching, being far-reaching means returning to the original point. End of the quotation. I do not say that this reading is not possible or inconsistent, in fact, the major, majority of commentators goes in this direction. Uh, go, goes in, the, in this direction. However, I would like to try another reading that follows a non-traditional interpretation of a Taoist scholar Li Yue. You have this um, of the Tang Dynasty. 
Uh, it is based on another, on, a, on another punctuation of the aforementioned fragment and on reading as verbs of some words traditionally read as nouns uh, or adjectives. In the translation of Qing Jie Wan, the second part of the chapter 25 reads as follows. You have it. Tao is grating, heaven is grating, earth is grating, and human being is also grating. There are four gratings in the universe, and human being is one of them. Human being models himself after earth's being air, after heaven's being heaven, after Tao's being Tao, that is, after Tziran, so it serves so being. End of the quotation. The first outcome of this of the change uh, of accent is that the hierarchical order of universe disappears. It seems more also more consistent with the philosophy of Taoism and the commentary of Wang B to the last verse to this verse. So uh, the commentary of Wang B is like as follows: taking that which is of itself what it is, so Tziran, as a model means taking squareness as a model. It, taking that which is of itself uh, what it is as a model means taking squareness as a model when among the squares and roundness when among round ones. And thus nothing, devi thus nothing deviating is nothing from that which is of itself what it is. So Tziran. Tziran as... I'm finished. Okay. Tziran as itself so... So Tziran as itself sowing or that which is of itself what it is, could be interpreted as formal indication of the facticity in the above mentioned sense. Just like uh, Eragnis in a uh, later Heideggerian philosophy, there are some scholars who are trying to, to, to make an approach to both. Eragnis as the event of appropriation is the name of the fact that everything is what it is, and that it comes to appearance in, uh, in presencing, and that at the very heart of this presencing there is absencing. All beings are perfect in the aforementioned uh, sense. They are becoming what they are from nowhere. As Gao, Gao Shang, another neo-Taoist, neo neo says, Everything is natural, Tziran, and that's not why it is so. End of the quotation. There is no ground, no reason, and no why for them being as they are. Again, it is not to be understood metaphysically as a process of individuation out of the non-individuated background, but as the Aristotelian, for me, in my reading, but as the Aristotelian energia of the utmost mobility of being in its form, morphe, of being put forth into its appearance. On the factual level of physis and tyran, all beings are to be perceived as incomplete actuality of the aforementioned acts. To live, to take an example of Aristotle, to live at the same time means to have lived and not cease to live in the hic et nunc of presence. To be for a, to be for a flower is not coming forth into uh, is the coming forth into appearance into presence as blooming and at the same time having bloomed and not ceasing to bloom. This perfect and infinite presence of being, of, of being one, what one is, of being appropriated into one's own is the mark of the very finitude of every being, since the flower is put away by fruit coming forth also. On the one hand, so we have, as uh, in Taoism, like in Lao Tzu says, a violent wind does not last for a whole morning, a sudden rain does not last for the whole day, chapter 23. But on the, but on the other hand, I, 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 I quote Heidegger, uh, with its very coming to life, every living thing already begins to die. And conversely, dying is but a kind of living, because only a living being has the ability to die. Uh, end of the quotation. It is not a time process, process in a physical sense, but rather it is, it is spatial-temporal because it is beforehand always already a factitious movement of the selfhood of auto, kat auto, and of zi, zi, uh, ji, uh, shizen. This perfect immanence of has something from the absolute understood also etymolo etymologically. So absolute coming, 
absolute coming, the, the name of absolute coming from the Latin absolvo can be analyzed as se luo, indicating the, I, I'm uh, quoting Agamemnon, indicating the work of loosening, freeing luo that leads or leads back something to its own se. The se is a, uh, it is a, the se is, it is a movement of appropriation present in the Indo-European reflexive uh, pronoun se, like uh, in Latin languages. Uh, so, in fact, it's a, uh, absolute based on the, the meaning of this reflexive pronoun. It is a movement of... Uh, it is also present, this se, in the Greek expression katauto, meaning absolutely, that is considering something according to itself. We have encountered it already in the definition of physics, seemingly uh, in the same way one V says that which is of itself what it is, is a word for the designationless, an expression for getting to the ultimate, end of the quotation. The movement of appropriation, uh, it, so the itself sowing is always accompanied by the moment of othering or absencing. In this, in this direction could, we, uh, could be interpre in interpreted, for example, Wu Wei, as letting other things be what they are and other from us, for example. But uh, the movedness as a facticity of presencing and absencing could be easily misunderstood as some dialectical process of position and negation. This risk runs also Taoism, sometimes interpreted as a kind of dialectics of nature. It should not, since the logical negation and opposition presupposes the absence as, as, as privation, which is also some kind of presence. One could say that at the very heart of presence, there is an absence, since morphe, so, and thesis, because physis is morphe, are set in two ways. Dichos legetai. I quote uh, Aristotle, for the privation too is a way of form. But I don't have time to, to, to develop this, this doubleness. So I leave it to further consideration whether this factitional mobility in its duality of presence and absence of appearing and disappearing of light and darkness, if you want, could be in some way universalistic. So we can finally, uh, I have to, um, to end, I suppose, we can finally formulate a definition of uh, physics uh, and Tsiran let's say, in its factitional dimension, and I'm quoting here the, uh, uh, Heidegger on, his, on physics, but I think that it could, in my reading, also apply to this Tsiran. And so they are both, you have this quote on the, on the Hangout. So physics is the presence of the absence of itself, one that, that is on the way from itself and unto, unto itself. As such, an absentic physis remains an uh, ongoing back into itself, but this going back is only the going of a uh, going forth. End of the quotation. Thank you for your... I don't have any you know, uh, knowledge about uh, classic Chinese, so it's going to be very difficult for um, uh, being critical about your uh, conversation. But let's, um, let's see uh, that I give the comment before. If you have questions, uh, don't forget to be precise on this. Yes. Um, you know, I'm a translator, so I have a bit of a question about translating terms. I, I think your um, presentation is excellent footnote um, to um, prove why we can translate uh, physics into Zeranian or also other way around. And um, if you would translate Zeran into German into English, would you take nature or would you take um, big self sewing? It's self sewing, but. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was the, 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 my point, the paper. I mean, it's, it's not like already the nature, what we call nature, that's uh, it's in this retrograde reading, it's not what physics was, as understood. But it like gave these two notions of over, like this uh, all encompassing nature. 
uh, and the second one, the, the, the nature of the essence of something. So the uh, fist is understood as a substance. So like an all-encompassing substance of whole, the totality, or the suchness of everything, of substance. So it is, this uh, in Chinese was, uh, I mean, the nature as a, nature of a thing is xin, I think. It is say uh, of, uh, of uh, Japanese. So uh, yeah, my, 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 all my, my point was to, 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 to try to make it like a, this, to access to the both concept through the, through the mobility. But uh, the mobility that I, I, like we have always the image of mobility as some, 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 some kind of, uh, yeah, movement in a, that presupposes space and time. In fact, uh, I wanted to uh, make a reading based on the Aristotle and his statement that physics is morphe of energia, but incomplete, incomplete ateles, ateles. Uh, I want to make this uh, to show that the mobility in some way is the before space and time. But the, the problem of what does it mean before, proton, it's a, I mean, that I, will, I have to, yeah, that's complicated. In what sense proton is not, for example, temporal, it can be logical, like before the, con the condition of possibility. But I wanted to, to approach this uh, level of the vague type movedness and interpret physics, and then more, I mean, I want I totally to agree, but then, yeah. just as a translator, this, yeah. this translation of the PG1 is just horrible to read, and uh, ah, okay. I know that, uh, I, uh, and based on your Heidegger meeting of um, physics, I mean, nature is already a translation of physics into Latin, yeah. so I don't know why you can't take Natur or nature as uh, a translation of translation for the run. I I think. Mean, it's like a continuity in the past, so we can take the Latin, Latin is and conversion the term for our But I think you, you can, but with footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> with big footnotes. That it's not a, a big receptacle of what's going on, uh, what's happening. Or, uh, okay. Because uh, Oh. Just maybe one more question, otherwise there isn't um, any more food for us. Than <laughs> oh, yeah, that's uh, it, it, it never really uh, occurred to me that you would take this this concept or the concept of nature and use Aristotle and Heidegger to describe it. I mean, that would have been the last place I would have looked. Um, so it, it's kind of interesting to see what you did with it. But why not use um, Ereusina? Because that seems to be almost a literal translation of exactly what you were trying to do with morphe and energy and movement and going out of itself and back to itself and presence and absence. Uh, Ariadna had the idea of natura. Mm -hmm. It's always either natura, naturans. Yeah? So nature, naturing. I mean, in natura, naturata. Which is, is, and it's this constant movement. And it's a, it's a wonderful little um, uh, concept that I often encourage people to use as a, as a model for getting into Oriental philosophy without having to go through, you know, the, the Aristotelian, Platonic, Scholastic. Or, it's um, just a thought, that's all. Yeah. And you know that he used to do the first time it was in. No, that's all. Yeah, it goes back to the but uh, I, I tried this Heideggerian reading because uh, there is, when you use Natura there is always this, uh, the concept of production, it's a producing, or uh, like an artifact. And that is what not, uh, at least Heidegger wants. To not to, to, to make a, uh, to understand nature, this is, as a, self-producing machine, mm -hmm. but as appearing, like blooming of the fire, and the, all the problem is how to make this appearing, so producing, like producere, like going forth, mm -hmm. which is not technical poiesis. Okay. And because I, I think this is natural, natural, especially that uh, denaturated, uh, 
I mean, like uh, you can you can easily go to this uh, uh, heavy he heavy model of uh, yeah production as a. I mean, uh, because I tried to just to try I tried to to see uh, to see if it's possible to to uh, of course it's internally difficult because uh, what kind of course metaphysics is of course what not everyone thinks that is metaphysics. But I wanted to see if it's his non-metaphysical uh, reading of physics, which is not natural materials in fact. Could be applied to theorem uh, mm -hmm. and not understood as a uh, yeah like a self-productive thing, like a kinetic dynamic thing. That's another thing that uh, a movement shouldn't be uh, understood uh, as a uh, dynamics, but more more like a dynamics, more like a an area in fact, not like a highest potentiality of something that will, will give us what, what we have. But already what we have, it's this movement. I mean, uh, okay. that is... <laughs> One more uh, last announcement, sorry. Uh, so we need to sign for all the register posts and other reception fees. And I want to make a big uh, applause for the